Bucks County, Pennsylvania, long known for its bucolic beauty and rich history. It is here that General George Washington made his famous crossing of the Delaware in 1776. Visitors flock to this area about an hour's drive northeast of Philadelphia for the beautiful scenery, excellent restaurants, and shopping. If you spend more than just a day trip, there are close to 100 beautiful inns and bed and breakfasts for a weary traveler to enjoy a peaceful night's rest. I said to them, I said, was it a, a woman's voice or a man's voice? They said, they couldn't tell, but it was very definite. Turn it off, turn it off now. And then she felt the pressure on her arm. And uh, Mother's Day, uh, there was a bartender in the, in the bar itself uh, making drinks. And he noticed uh, some woman was sitting at a table directly across from him. And this woman kept staring at him. And he got to the point where he thought that there might have been a problem, so he asked her was, if he could assist her with anything. And she said, no, but there's somebody in the bar with you. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> I don't think anyone can look at that piece of tape and, and question that something is there. Um, you may not be able to make the form out properly. People might have different interpretations of what that is. But there's definitely something there. Ash Mill Farm in bucolic Holly Kong, Pennsylvania, is the epitome of the genteel farm. Even the spirits here seem as laid back as the guests. <laughs> Hi. Perhaps for the unseen guests, this indeed is their final resting place. Well, we've got to have some men here. There's three women. There's three females. I mean, I, I'm, they're not manifested in the materialization, but yeah, I can feel the. the the, the, the female essence that they had in her well, this is probably where they spent last all the life. Time if it's yeah. Because it's like a little welcoming committee. Oh. Richard, what are you doing? Oh, my. Richard, he's standing there. Never shoot that picture of him on camera. She'll tell me. Right, right. See yeah. the blue? Yeah. That's yeah. her soul. She is the, what I've called the head female. Here we go. The head female. No, I don't want to say that. The, the lady the, of the house. The, the yes. The house. Yes. Yeah. The prominent female. You can open it up. Okay. Oh, oh, there's a little boy in here. Richard, stay in there, stay in there. <laughs> oh, aren't you so, you're so precious. Excuse <laughs> me. Stand back there. Oh, you were so cute. Oh, there's a little girl in there too, right up here. Could we have your picture, your image? This is the mother. Yeah, that's her. That's her. She's following you around. Yeah, that. Let, let, let them see her, too. You'll love this. It's the lady. You'll, you'll, you'll see. You'll recognize her. Oh, my goodness. Let's see how nice and solid she is. She knows more about us than we do. Now, they, 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 I'll tell you something. I'll tell you a secret in case any guests ever ask you. No spirit will go into a bathroom. They, I know this, you know, but there's so many people that ask me this question, so I figure, and since you have guests here and everything, um, they, they afford all of us, we the living, privacy, absolutely. And they know when you are either requiring it or wishing it, you, you know. But uh, I've had so many people say, when I go in the bathroom, no, they don't go in. They might sit outside of the door and wait for you, but they're not going to come in. They couldn't care less. <laughs> See, like a teenage boy. No, not you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that nice flash. Very nice, right there. Uh huh. 
Oh, the grandma. Oh, aren't you bright? Hello. There's a grandma in here. Grandma spirit. Oh, right up here. Not exactly there, but just be a little teeny weeny weeny still. Come on. I love you. Come on, come on. You see them? They're right in front of you, Rob. They're coming up. That's it. Come on up. Come on. You'll hear their cool in a second. Come on. So he's outside. Richard, you missed them. I didn't see you. There's a gold. Gold. Oh my, you're regal. That's a regal. So, oh, got a bug in my hair. Can't get him out, he's in the hairspray. Uh-oh. Mm-mm. You can't get that on tape, right? I mean, I see my parents. I see my grandparents. I see so many of my relatives. I see my cousin and his wife, who, who crossed over very young. I don't like to say died, because we don't die. Die, no. The body expires. It's like, your, like, like a winter coat. What do you do when you have a winter coat and it starts to get a little... Mm -hmm. You love it and you hate to part with it, but you really can't, don't want to wear it. Yeah, you know, ooh, I can't fix that. So you, you, you get another one. Well, hey, you know, we shed our mortal body and we move, move on into this incredible life. You're given the option, usually, to return in spirit form or another mortal form. Please, no more mortal form. Please. <laughs> The Ottsville Inn in Ottsville, Pennsylvania has been a local haunt for more than a century. Here, serving spirits takes on a whole new meaning. Come on. You see if we can help ourselves to beer for breakfast, right? Oh, stop. We're being served spirits. Catherine. Come meet Catherine. Richard. Hurry up, Richard. She's right in front of the uh, bagpipe man. Happy hour. There's about a dozen of them right around them, and they don't even know it. Around the people. The three people at the bar. What are you doing down here? Rich? Shoot down here. You got some shy ones here. Here, come and open a nice bar. Come open a dining room. They're hanging down here by the coats. Come I don't on. know what that is. Let me see. I don't know what that is. I don't know if that's is it the door. Yeah, there's somebody up there, though. That's who I wanted you to. There's Henrietta. You're taking pictures of my friends in this chair, Richard. Stand back here, okay? Stand back so you don't want to get close up and scare them to death. Oh, I don't mean scare them to death. That's stupid. Excuse me. <laughs> oh, Rob, look how beautiful he is. He's beautiful. Thank you. I love you for that. I love you for that. Oh, God, look what he did. Oh, he's, a, he's an old soul, Rob. Look, he's beautiful gold. Oh, that was so beautiful of you to do that. Thank you. I've got the good chills. Mm-hmm. There's quite a few right outside the men's room. <laughs> the Bucksville House in Kintnersville, Pennsylvania, is a beautifully restored colonial-era inn where, after a peaceful night's rest, you may be awakened by its former colonial era maids still tidying up after three centuries. Some guests do ask if the, if the house is haunted and our policy is not to say anything, particularly um, if um, 
people might be fearful. So we, we never initiate that question or we never say, oh, do you know we have, have ghosts in the house? Uh, our first experience when we were renovating, we had a checkerboard uh, up in one of the bedrooms. And being busy and, and not taking time when I dusted, I never set them back up for a game. And I would uh, go by and they would be set up for a game. And I thought, well, you know, this is at a time when no one was in the house. We weren't booking rooms. And I said to my husband, I said, how do you have time to go back upstairs and set the checkers up for a game? He said, you know, I'm not up there. I'm, I'm not doing that. And this was one of the first inklings that I knew we weren't alone here. Are they the original steps? Hello, come on down. Come on down. We're here. Kathy's approach um, in the house right away was almost like uh, a reverence. She, um, as some of the people that have come through and, and are interested in it, are more, um, I would say, uh, curious, not as respectful. And I think. If I could describe Kathy in one word, it would be respectful of the dead. And throughout our experience with her in the house, she was very um, courteous. Um, I would say almost thankful that they were there. She appreciated what they were doing. She said that she loved the spirits. And you could get a whole feeling of, of spirituality with her. And I think she approaches it from um, that these are real people. They're just maybe on a different plane that we're used to seeing, but she, she had almost a calming influence, and I think that's probably one of her assets, is, and I think they feel it because they present themselves to her because of her, her reverence and respect for them, uh, which I don't think a lot of people have. I think uh, a lot of people see the, the spirit world as something silly or something to be um, exposed uh, as a hoax, and, and you don't get that feeling with her. What is your name? Teresa. Teresa. That's what I thought it was. Was there a Teresa? The original family? Tell me how you came here. You lived here. just center right in that corner but she's starting back and forth come on everybody everybody all together we had a guest early in December that had never been in a bed and breakfast before and uh, she and her uh, husband were in the room uh, at the top of the stairs to the left and um, he was a smoker so he woke her up early on a Saturday morning to go outside to have a cigarette and she said I'm just going to lay in bed a little bit longer and relax so he left the room and she was uh, in there probably trying to go back to sleep when two ladies came in the room and they said we're here to tidy up and having never been in a bed and breakfast before she didn't realize that that's not what we do and she thought my goodness they're in here cleaning up and I'm not even out of bed yet and she was a little bit upset because she said her suitcase was open the clothes were strewn around and she said the one lady walked around to the foot of the bed over to the windows where we have a quilt rack and she started adjusting the quilts and straightening out the the bedding on the quilt rack and the second lady started tugging on her bedding and straightening out the covers while she was in the bed and she was a little bit anxious and again upset that we would send somebody in already to clean up the room. And she also noticed that they were wearing colonial clothes. She said, my goodness, she said they've even dressed the help in colonial clothes and described the one lady as wearing a dust ruffle hat, possibly white like a handkerchief, and long skirt and almost uh, like a homespun material. 
Uh, recently, we took uh, a picture of Joe uh, doing some uh, renovation and building in a room, and we got almost like a, a mist or um, kind of a cloud behind him, like someone was, was actually standing behind him during the renovation. We have a picture of that. And recently, after uh, Kathy was here, uh, she had said that almost anyone can take a picture. So I went back in my photo album, specifically looking for some, some things that maybe I had missed before, and found in the living room a face of a man, uh, very distinct, uh, looks like he has a beard. And the day that Kathy had come here, um, we had seen a similar face in, in one of the bedrooms. So I said, well, there's the same guy. It's a man with gray hair. Very pale blue eyes, full beard. If you just focus on that picture, or, or that, um, oh, I imagine it's a document of some kind, awesome. but it's a man, and he's, he's an elderly man. As he was in life, you're seeing him, he's got like a grayish, silver beard, real pale blue eyes, okay? And his ears, his ears are coming like this. When I taught school, I had two uh, sisters that helped me clean, and so they were here when I was at work. But um, there was one in particular day that they waited for me to come home from school. They were uh, agitated and nervous. And I said, what's going on? And they said, oh, something happened in the attic today. And I said, what? And they said, well, we're not going up there alone again. And I said, well, tell me what happened. The one sister had gone up to vacuum. And she's vacuuming in the attic. A voice says to her, turn it off, turn it off now. And she feels a pressure on her arm. Thinking it's her sister, she turns. She said, why do you want me to, and there's no one there. So she calls, she said, uh, why do you want me, she's calling down the stairs now, why do you want me to turn off the vacuum? Well, the sister cannot hear her because she's two flights down in the kitchen getting cleaning supplies out. So she runs down and she says to her sister, why did you want me to turn the vacuum off? She said, I don't know what you're talking about. She said, I've been here getting cleaning tools. She said, well, somebody up there told me to turn the vacuum off. And so they went up there, and no one was there. And from that point on, when they would clean, they cleaned together, especially in the attic. And when I got home that day, they were totally freaked out and agitated with that particular story. They were scared. They don't work here anymore. Located in the tiny town of Center Bridge, the Center Bridge Inn has mysteriously burned to the ground twice in its history. Here, blenders turn on by themselves. Curtains rise up and remain perfectly straight. Some reveling patrons have rolled beer bottles down the bar, only to have them roll back. Everybody. Oh, I bet you all like it up here, huh? This is nice. Philippe, Monsieur. Oh, I can say it's Nescafe and Santa Flush. That's all I can say. I don't know how to speak your language. Come on. All right, come on, you guys. Uh, you and your wife. Oh, oh that thing hurt. <laughs> that backpack hit me right in the spine. <laughs> it's a beautiful blue spirit soul. Spirit soul. They're making me talk crazy. Well, where is your wife? Oh. Ah. On the shade, on the wood. Come back on the shade, back on the shade, shade, shade. Up, 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 up. That's my door. I think it's individual room control. That's why it's so hot up here. We should put it on in one room. Can you see what that says? What does it say? Honeywell. Rebecca. Rebecca, Rebecca, Rebecca. 
Please show up, Rebecca. Don't make a goof out of me, please. And who's those two people with you? Rebecca. Rebecca. Coriel? This is sweet, isn't it? Yeah, it's sweet. I don't mean S-U-I-T-E. Oh, so I left TV on. Oh. <laughs> what? What did you do? She said the TV was on. I saw the red light, so I turned it off. It was turned on. Okay. Come on, Rebecca. Come on with us. Oh, we're going to party downstairs. You and me will be the only bro that's there. How about that? Oh. 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 <laughs> you get all this on uh, the outtakes, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh my, how embarrassing. <laughs> Domino effect of klutz. See, it's not just me. Now you, you, you both... <laughs> Rob got a concussion <laughs> in that other bedroom. You have klutzed in a couple places. Over in the bird thing. Bird cage. Well, it's not a bird bath. <laughs> Aye, bats. <laughs> Might be. Of course, this is a new attic. You know what I'm saying? They don't care. I mean, you know, an attic is an attic. It's the same ground, but it still doesn't have the the history, the ambiance that, of course, the original would have. We fall through the floor, someone's gonna have to call an ambiance. Oh, and it's pretty. Oh, come on, let's go. Oh, did they desert you? Well, I tell you what, come in here. We'll go join them. Simple as that. Come on. Everybody, come on. And how are you today? Just north of New Hope, perched on the edge of the Delaware River, is the Black Bass Hotel. The tavern has served patrons since 1740. It appears that many spirits here have stayed well after closing time. We don't actually, we don't actually advertise that, that we have ghosts. Uh, some people do, do inquire about that if, uh, if the hotel is, is haunted. Uh, especially when people find out that and we have been an operational hotel and restaurant for over 250 years, so a lot of people are curious as if uh, we have any good stories. Over the years, uh, I've heard many stories about, uh, about sightings in, in the bar area itself, and it only seems to revolve around children, uh, young children. And I've heard this happen, happen back, uh, as was actually mentioned, uh, from the, the 70s uh, up to the present day. But uh, one curious time it actually happened where uh, I was part of it, where I was in my office, and uh, uh, there was a group of people that were staying in the hotel, and they're standing outside my door, and they're all talking about uh, about which room they were in and, and uh, what ghost was in their room. And uh, one of the young children came up to the mother that was uh, uh, just stopped by to uh, to visit with the family, and uh, the young child mentioned that uh, he was in the bar and he saw uh, saw a gentleman down at the bar that. Uh, that really didn't understand what, uh, what he was doing there. Uh, so as I was listening to this, I, I walked out and I, I joined in the conversation and I mentioned that, uh, that they met Hans. Um, and as it goes, it's only young children that witness this, uh, this person in the bar. And it winds up being a, a large burly guy. He has a, has a long beard. Uh, he has a hat with a feather in it and he has a military insignia on his shoulder. And over the years, all the children that mention uh, this person that they see at the bar, they always describe them being at the exact same spot, 
uh, the exact same appearance, and uh, it's only uh, small children that, uh, that uh, mention him. company behind me. As the story goes, as far as uh, I could ascertain, um, two guests uh, uh, witnessed somebody in the middle of the night uh, with a woman wearing a white dress with a, a pearl handle pistol that was standing, uh, standing by the, the foot of the bed. A few years later as well, it was brought up again by uh, some other guests that they mentioned that they had a, a visitor in the evening and they described the same type of person, that it was uh, a woman in a, in a white dress, a white flowing dress, and she had a, a pearl handle pistol as well. Oh my. Uh, this was something that, that was mentioned to me uh, that happened back in the 60s. Uh, there was a, a full dining room at that point. There was probably about 25 persons in there. And right on top of the hearth, there was a candelabra that was lit, that was uh, just, uh, 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 just burning right above the fireplace. At one point, uh, somebody gasped in the middle of the dining room, uh, loud enough that everybody focused, uh, focused on the fireplace. And when everybody looked, the candelabra was moving and it actually moved off of, the, uh, off of the fireplace and fell onto the floor. You can't stay here. You have to go into the light. That's part of your destiny. No. No, you're not supposed to stay here. You're not needed here. No, you have to go into the light. Okay? Any of you who haven't been into the light, you must go into that light. That's your destiny. Well, you both have to go. There were two, um, I guess you'd call them like roguish pirates in here who hadn't fully crossed over. You know, the, the entire crossing over process. They didn't go into the light. Um, so they didn't have to access the light. So when I put my hand on the wall, I, t I invited them to use my life force and to go through me, use my life force. And, and that always, always has worked. Mother's Day, uh, there was a bartender in the, in the bar itself uh, making drinks. And he noticed uh, some woman was sitting at a table directly across from him. And this woman kept staring at him. And he got to the point where he thought that there might have been a problem, so he asked her is, if he could assist her with anything. And she said, no, but there's somebody in the bar with you. And uh, she, she was so, he, my server was so taken back that uh, um, he inquired more about it. He said, well, what do you mean there's, there's somebody in the bar with me? And at this point, the husband turned around and looked at the server and turned back around to the wife. And uh, the server could tell that they, they were not joking around, that she was actually seeing somebody. And she said that there's a woman uh, right next to you, and she keeps walking through the bar over to the fireplace and back to the bar again. And she looks like she's distraught, and, uh, and she doesn't want to be here, but uh, um, she just keeps pacing back and forth between the, the fireplace back into the bar where you're standing. Um, needless to say, the, the bartender didn't spend much more time that evening in the bar. One of the first and largest bed and breakfasts in New Hope is the Wedgwood Inn. It sits on the same grounds where General George Washington and his men camped before the famous crossing of the Delaware in 1776. In the 1800s, slaves are said to have passed through to freedom in its mysterious underground tunnel. Could it be that some still remain? Unusual activity occurs um, throughout. There are a couple of specific bedrooms that uh, have a little more activity because they're near the Underground Railroad or they're near the, uh, the secret entrance to it. Sarah has only revealed herself three times since 1982 and only to other 12-year-old girls and only to other 12-year-old girls in this particular room because this is the room that is above this, that secret staircase. And Mr. Black in the 1830s and 1840s was the 
mill owner, I'm sorry, was the foreman of the mills in town, and he evidently had some kind of um, accident, industrial accident, and he limped. So we sometimes hear him dragging his foot across the floor at night, and he often carries a lantern. So under a closed door, you'll see a, a light swaying, and Mr. Black is kind of checking that everybody's in and okay. And he has held a door uh, on me on several occasions, and I just have to ask Mr. Black to please let me out, and he listens. I think one of the most interesting um, sightings we have is uh, a historical character in New Hope, uh, the painter of Manchester Valley. His name is Joseph Pickett, and he was a self-taught artist who was um, a butcher in town at the turn of the 1900th century. And he evidently painted Manchester Valley, um, which depicts the mill behind our inn, the one that Mr. Black was the foreman for. And it depicts the schoolhouse on top of the hill, which is an 1840 schoolhouse. It turns out that he painted that picture from our property, from the backyard of our property. Other guests have seen him, and we have seen him actually painting. Uh, we remember a month after purchasing that in 1986, someone said, how did you hang that print so quickly? Because we just saw the fellow painting it. We said, no, this is just simply a print, not a painting. And that was the first sighting of Joseph Pickett, um, wearing a black coat with his uh, painter's palette and easel. Um, actually painting the colorful scene that we know today. And he has uh, evidently is, is a rather active spirit on Mechanic Street in New Hope. And evidently the, the placing of a, of a gazebo in 1985 on the probably about the exact spot where he painted has brought the spirit up this way where never before he has evidently come. And he's one of our more colorful characters and a lot of people enjoy talking to him and later learning that he doesn't really exist. Well, having lived here over 20 years, we thought we knew everything about the house, um, its pre-Revolution War history, um, and its, some of its spirits. But when we knocked down a rear addition and we um, built a, a new addition with, with a deep basement, we discovered an underground railway passage or tunnel that we later learned was used both by the Revolution and War soldiers who camped here and later by the abolitionists who lived in the house, the Quakers who in the 1840s, 1850s, and 1860s participated in the Underground Railroad, which brought uh, f newly freed slaves up from the South to the safety of New York and Canada. Well, I tell you one thing. This is a really uh, intense. <laughs> That's my favorite word. It's very intense. Do you see it at the bottom of the gate? Mm -hmm. Also, yeah. there's some in the background that we're paying. I know. You really got them up over there in the corner. I know. I, they're, they're trying to tell me something. 1858. Jesus, me. Bear with me. Camera's ready. There were piles of bodies here. Eighteen fifty eight. I don't know how that's got anything to do with anything. Eighteen fifty eight.
Come on. You go over there. Come on now. Don't you be scaredy cat. Come on. Come on. I love you too. It's all right. You're welcome. One of the five oldest continually operating inns in the United States, the Logan Inn opened in 1722. Leading psychics and mediums have proclaimed it to be one of the most authentically haunted buildings in America. There have been five psychics through, the most believable being Hans Holzer, who's written books on the subject. And he brought a medium with him, and we didn't discuss where and what had happened in the inn. Uh, they went into different rooms, and when they went into room six, immediately they said, they felt pressure, as though someone was either pushing them out of the room or the pressure of someone being underwater. And the other thing that they both concurred upon was that it was the spirit of a woman who lived and perhaps died there. I love you, Emily back. I missed you all so much. I really, really missed you. I had a, a um, writer in from Ohio the week before Halloween. And she totally believes in the spirits. And she said uh, she was doing an article for a paper. And she said when she left, some very unusual things had occurred. She said she felt she woke because she felt someone had sat on the end of the bed. And we have these big puffed up down quilts on the bed. This happens to be a Victorian bed. It's one of the original pieces in the in. She turned on the light. No one was in the room, but she looked at the end of the bed, and there, at the end of the bed, there was an impression of someone who had sat on the end of the bed. There's a depression on the quilt. Even the, oh, they must have done the whole painting. It's so bright. And the sky. Honestly, it looks like the whole, it was, they did the whole painting, didn't they? I gotta touch that. I'm gonna touch it. Oh, and I'd love to touch your hand. I know it's just a portrait, but you're so mm, beautiful. The other person who had quite an unusual experience was a man that I hadn't met before. His name was Mr. Adams. And later I found out that he had written a book on the subject of hauntings of buildings within the area, the Logan being one of them. But when he left, he said he'd stayed in many inns in this country, in England, in Australia, but never had such an odd experience as he had at the inn. I said, whatever happened? Because I'd never really heard anything that was that extreme or dramatic. But he said, in the middle of the night, someone knocked on his door, and he felt that the door had opened. Well, we have double locks on the door. There's no way, unless someone had a master key, that they would open a door. So 
he went to the door. The door at that point had closed. He went to the door, opened the door. There was no one in the hallway. And at one point, he felt there was scratching on the outside wall. He just said there were so many unusual things that occurred, and he didn't explain many more to me other than those. OK, you want to hold the door so we won't get caught in here like Lucy and Ethel? <laughs> you hold that now. OK. Oh, so you can, ex OK. See, they can, they can pass through certain things that they like, like, see this here? This could very well be a, a full, a full jar of cherries, yet any spirit who, who enjoyed cherries in life, they can pass their essence through any, anything for, for, for uh, liquids or solids, and they can experience the essence, the memory of what it was. I've had this happen many times. They always feel as though there's someone in the room watching them. And one time someone was in the ladies in the bathroom and she said someone was tapping her on the shoulder and she turned around, no one was there. And I said, oh, there's a hook on the door. That's probably why you felt someone tapping you on the shoulder. She said, oh, not in that room. There isn't a hook on the door. <laughs> They're just things that happen that you can't explain. Pineapple Hill rests on land originally granted to William Penn. The inn has only changed hands six times in its history. Perhaps in a visit to the inn, you'll encounter one of its previous owners. It was really interesting in preparing um, to talk to you. I read, reread all of the room diaries from 1995 through present and realized that although there had been talking, um, people had written about unusual activity throughout, that it really started to get um, heavier in 1996. And we were thinking, what happened? And then we realized that was when we did all the excavation work for the addition, so that maybe something when we were doing the the addition um, stirred up all, all this extra activity because it was almost right down to the the few months that we were working on it all of a sudden we started to see all this this proliferation and writing about activity here martina come on out Who wants to come over here? We got a nice, pretty lady in here. Richard? Oh, you're beautiful. Right here. Hovering up off the bed. He's right behind me. John! Bombs, you're tickling me. Oh, do you keep journals in the rooms? That is so great. That is really, really wise. Because anybody that stays in each room can write down any experience they have. Mm -hmm. And then you can have someone. Then you can have someone um, compile all the do and you, or you yourself could do it if you like. And have a nice book like every six months or whatever, every year. I remember while serving breakfast um, at the inn, the first guests I was, was very vivid about telling me that they had had a really wild dream where they were, there was a man riding horseback and he was set more in, um, I don't want to say colonial garb, but he had on a long wool coat and, and um, yeah, kind of like your, what you would picture as your typical revolutionary garb. And the man was riding down a path, and there were cher uh, cherry trees or fruit trees on either side. And the horse bucked up, and the man started to fall off. And she woke up, and she woke up like really 
almost in cold sweats and very freaked out about the whole thing. And she came down to breakfast and was telling everyone at breakfast. And then about eight months later, the same thing happened again. And at that point, I came up, we have room diaries in each room. And I came up and read the room diary thinking, oh, well, somebody wrote it. In, the, the, the first woman had written it down and then maybe the second woman was reading it right before she went to bed and it made her dream it. But it wasn't listed anywhere in any of the room diaries in any of the rooms. And then it happened a third time, maybe about a year ago. So there was about two years in between. And then it happened again. Oh, wow. You know, you can almost feel like when it was new. Wait till you come to the barn. You can almost hear the noises of the animals. So oh, you look up the wow. Are up. Oh, that's great. Rosalie, could you tell me your last name? Cross? Rosalie Cross. Rosalie Cross. Did your family live in the area? Salisbury. Salisbury? You're beautiful. You're all beautiful. <clears throat> but, um, I don't know. I don't know what it is. You just never know when it's going to come back. Some people, or there was a couple that came and it was really recently, it was only a few months ago, a couple kept coming, they came and I forget the word they were using, nightmarish maybe, something that had me really upset and then the one said, yeah, to the other one, yeah, this is really great, we were hoping it would be that way and I realized they were looking for a really haunted experience and they were pleased. Ariana Miles, near Lake Nakamixon in Upper Bucks County, first opened as a rough and tumble stagecoach stop in the late 1700s. The current owners have brought back its rustic charm, along with several of its original Native American clientele. This area of Bucks County, you know, we were uh, the perfect Bucks County tourists. You know, all of Bucks County is defined by New Hope and Peddler's Village. Um, so it was like, you know, and, and Doylestown was sort of like this hike. So um, the idea of this area called Quaker Town was like, you know, where is this? But we thought, oh, let's, let's go. Um, so it just kept coming up during the course of probably four years. Luckily for us, at a lower and lower price. Yeah. <laughs> We're going upstairs. Yeah, I'll follow you. Nice gal, it was a way. She was back in New York. She was, she was still living in New York. Yet just just purchased the house um, and I was home alone and uh, I spent a lot of time here on the first floor uh, it was one of the only inhabitable parts of the house at the time and uh, spent a lot of time in the bar right outside the bar is the sunroom and I had seen an image uh, white flash by and you know of course he you know, plays those tricks on you and, uh, did a double take and that the image was there again, just just you know casually walking past and then just in vivid detail, the hoop skirt, the blue ribbon around her waist, uh, you know the the, the the puffs on the shoulders, all the way up to actual seeing her hair, you know the hair up in the back and everything like that, and never really made mention of it uh, except to, to Pascal. And sometime after that, our, our neighbor. Uh, who had, we, we had just made acquaintances uh, with at the 
time, um, saying, have you seen her? Um, I said, well, who is she? And he went in to describe this woman that he has seen sitting on a bench near a uh, large pine tree. And she would sit there and relax, I guess. And um, ex exact same details. And not too long after that, we were in, uh, going through New Hope and stopped in an antique shop there and was speaking to the shop owner. Uh, she was questioning when we were opening the inn and someone else had overheard us and said, well, you have a bed and breakfast. And we said, yes, we do. And she said, do you have presents? And Pascal and I looked at each other and were like, yes, we do. And that's when it, it turned out to be Adele Gamble. And uh, she said, she's with you. And went in to, to describe our, our lady in white in, in the exact same detail as I have seen and my friend had seen. So uh, it was nice to know that she was traveling with us as well. There's a man, I'd say, from 1890s with a derby materialized right in front of, right at the stem looking out the window. There's our little girl in here. We saw some apps. Some of the stuff was uh, just just indescribable. Uh, there were just you know light flashes and swirls that you, that came up on on the digital. And uh, the one 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 instance in particular, which which I was you know using rationale at first, I had seen the the spirit form, the the orb. Uh, with my with a naked eye, I didn't see it on the camera and kept it to myself at the moment. I was like, oh, I didn't see that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then just at that moment, that's when Kathy turned around and said, every now and then you'll see them in the flash of the camera. So I was like, I just did. <laughs> you know, it was kind of neat. A lot of pets. Children? Yes. Back there. What do you think? Back there. That's where I was. Uh-huh. Yeah, right back there in all that uh, briar. That's no trick. Right, it's not. It's how do you, you there is a, a solid presence that moves. It can't, it's not a tree. It's, it wasn't just some ethereal glow. It's that not just an kind of animal. It's not, I mean, it's not solid enough to be something. There's some serious definition there. I mean, muscularity, the, the, the whole bit, I'm sorry. That wasn't just power of suggestion that saw that, I mean. Mm -hmm something there. What you are about to witness is perhaps the most amazing manifestation of a spirit ever recorded on video. Is it a horse? Is it a donkey? Is it, you know, yeah, we, uh, I, just uh, how do you, how do you just, you can't explain that. Um, it's a friend on the list. Yeah, yeah. You, you, just, you just, there's just no way to explain it. I wish there was. I wish we could say that, oh, well, it was leaves rustling or something like that. It, I, it, not that it makes me feel any, is it, it makes me feel any better, or not that it makes me feel bad not to be able to explain it. I just think that there are so many people out there who'll, who'll just want to believe that there's got to be some other reason um, that you know it's kind of I, I just I mean feel very special to have this um, and glad that we're open to it um, but I'm sure many people would think we're just a little bit kooky <laughs> that happens anyway. yeah